Senator Elizabeth Warren, welcome to Hysteria. We are so glad you're here. Both of us have been longtime admirers of yours, and we made absolutely no effort to hide how excited we were about you running for president. And we won't apologize for the fact that we're both wearing Elizabeth Warren swag right now. So, <laughs> I am delighted to be <laughs> on Hysteria and in Hysteria, uh, and <laughs> also delighted to be with both of you. So let's have some fun. Yeah, let's have some fun. Okay, so at this point in 2016, this isn't a fun question, just to <laughs> um, At this point in 2016, almost everybody except maybe Vladimir Putin thought Hillary Clinton was going to win. So as a result, even though polling looks good for Biden-Harris, Alyssa and I spend most days oscillating between mild confidence and utter panic. So do you ever feel panicked or anxious about the election? And if so... What's your plan for how to handle it? And what would you tell anxious Democratic and progressive voters in the last days of the campaign? So I would say, like all of us, polling looks good right now. You know, you feel the little hopeful parts, but it felt really good four years ago. And obviously it didn't work out. In fact, it went so far wrong that we didn't know how wrong it could go. Um, so the way I think of this right now is that means use every day between now and November 3rd, every single day, because what you're gonna be able to do after that to affect the election, no, it's all gotta happen right now. First thing, obviously vote. Second thing is volunteer. Volunteer even if you've never volunteered before. Volunteer to spend an hour online talking to people, uh, uh, to call people, to text people, but put some energy into this. Talk to your friends, talk to your family, talk to the neighbors, talk to people in parking lots. And here's why. This is not only about winning, which it very much is on November 3rd. It's about winning big. It's about winning really big. Because the reason we wanna win really big is we wanna create the momentum for the kind of changes we need to make. We want to say to ourselves and to the rest of the world, no, we are not the America of Donald Trump. We are a different America. We are an America that cares for each other. We are an America that's going to attack this COVID crisis head on. We are an America that's going to make sure that everybody gets health care. We're an America that wants to cancel student loan debt. We're an America that wants to provide universal child care for all of our kids and expand social security and disability payments for people who need it. That's the America we are. So think of it this way. Every time you volunteer an hour, you spend time out getting more people in to vote. You're spending an hour not just on Joe Biden and Kamala Harris's win, you're spending an hour on canceling student loan debt. You're spending an hour on saying to the rest of the world, America has competent, caring leadership. So let's do this. Now to November 3rd. <laughs> so now let's take a second to indulge our optimism. Okay. What if, what if, all the extraordinary hard work and commitment pay off on election day or sometime shortly thereafter and joe biden and kamala harris will in fact restore integrity to the white house they will owe some of their victory to progressive voters who do the right thing and vote for them even though they're not a hundred percent on on board with joe biden's agenda so if democrats win how do progressive voters who supported people like you, Bernie Sanders, and Castro in the primary nudge centrists to the left? Once oh. in office, how do progressive voters hold centrist Democrats accountable? So I love this question. And right. I love it because I get to talk to the progressives. Basically, we know exactly how to do this, right? Think of it this way. We've been fighting uphill forever now, right? How big was the progressive movement in 2016? How big was it in 2012, right? Uh, pull out your magnifying glass. I'm not saying it wasn't there, but there weren't so many of us uh, when we started this. And now it's a big, vibrant movement with lots of people and lots of energy and lots of directions and lots of issues. So here's how I see it. Here's the, here's the big plan, the overview plan. We're going to bust our rear ends between now and November 3rd, then on November 4th, or maybe a little bit after that, 
We're going to celebrate for a day. We're going to take off the day, right? We're going to do, <laughs> right? All the celebration, woo right? <laughs> and, yeah. Oh, I see how you're laughing. You're into this, right? We're into this, yeah. This is a great oh, plan. And, and then the day after that, we're all back to work. Back to work, pushing back in the fight. Progressives cannot afford to be the folks that say, okay, we elected you now, <clears throat> get this done and we'll check in with you in four years. That is not how this is gonna happen. Now, what that's gonna mean is we're gonna have to work together. You can't, you can't push everything through the door at once. We're gonna have to pick up each other's fights as our own, but we're good at that as progressives. Uh, Julian and I talk about this a lot. So, you know, how we pull people together and how we say, as long as we promise we're gonna to get to all of them and get to them early, then then we will keep working. We're going to get to that student loan debt. We're going to get to immigration reform. We're going to end protecting our dreamers. We're going to get the pieces, but we're going to keep fighting for it. So I'm already making up my list. I don't know about you, but we lists. good. <laughs> we love lists. All the time. I'm a list maker. We know. <laughs> uh, yes. I guess, I guess that's no surprise. Isn't it? <laughs> but the list of all the things that can be done administratively, both by executive order and in the agencies themselves, once you have agencies, oh, like Department of Education that's not run by Betsy DeVos, or Environmental Protection Agency that's not run by a coal lobbyist, you know, once you have the right people in. So there are some things that are going to go that way, and then some, it's going to take Congress to step up. So we're going to get our list going. We're going to get our targets going for each of those lists. We're going to make it happen. That's so nice to hear. Um, this week, instead of uh, actually passing a COVID relief bill like voters want, uh, you're all, <laughs> the senator is already making a face like she knows what I'm going to say. <laughs> Ted Cruz <laughs> and some of his Republican colleagues introduced a proposed constitutional amendment banning court packing. So, Senator, why do you think they're doing this? And if Democrats take control of the government come January, do you see a coming tug of war between institutionalists who think we have to keep playing by the rules that Republicans just ignore and reformers that want to fix the judicial branch? And what's the first step that needs to happen policy-wise for the system to be fixed? So if we had truth in labeling about proposed laws like this one on court packing, it would be called the... Republicans stole two seats and they plan to keep them stolen. Uh, that's, that's the idea behind it. So look, we're going to have to do a lot of work to restore the integrity of our courts. And I want to be blunt here. It's not just the Supreme Court. For four years now, the Republicans have been packing our courts. They've been packing them with right-wing extremists. They've packed them with racists with sexists, with homophobes, with people who hate voting uh, other than their own tiny little elite group. Um, and we're gonna feel the impact of that for generations. So um, as uh, Leader Schumer says, it's all gonna be on the table. One piece I really wanna emphasize because you, you ask the right question and that is, how do you think of this in terms of structural change, institutional reform? Are we just gonna be the party that says, oh, when Republicans are in power, it's one set of rules, and then when Democrats are in power, the Republicans say, no, 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 we have to do things differently. And my view around this is we're gonna to have to tackle filibuster mm -hmm. uh, head on. This idea that if, and you'll hear me knocking on wood in the background, we get the White House, we get the Senate, we get the House of Representatives. That means we can get things done. We cannot give Mitch McConnell a veto in the Senate so that nothing gets done. Think about it this way. What do the Republicans want to do in this world? Well, basically, they don't want to pass any laws to help people. Have we seen that pretty clearly? Um, they just want to pass laws to cut taxes. That's kind of their main thing. Um, they get that through on 50 votes. The laws to help people are always subject to these 60 vote thresholds because of the filibuster. That's, that's not a level playing field. And we can't fight this hard, hard fight 
on behalf of people who've been shut out of the system for so long, on behalf of Americans who need to get rid of that student loan debt, who need health care coverage, who need child care, who need expanded social security. We can't fight those fights only to walk in and say, oh, Mitch McConnell decided no, 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 no. So I think that if Mitch McConnell tries to pull out the filibuster in the next Senate, then I think the answer is we're going to have to get rid of it. We just can't do this. Um, and for me, I, I think of it this way. The filibuster can't solve every problem we have, but we can't solve any of the problems if Mitch McConnell gets to veto everything we do through a filibuster. So there's big structural reform. It's <laughs> going to take some energy to get everybody on board for it. Uh, but I think it's worth fighting for so that we'll be able to do what we need to do. So, Senator, we get a lot of tweets and emails and Instagram messages from listeners who tell us that four years of being angry and afraid have left them very, very tired. So if Donald Trump loses, God willing, and Democrats take the Senate, how do we convince the exhausted voters who got it done that our work is actually just starting? So I think nothing gives you energy like winning. It's true. And, and nothing gives you energy like making change. So let me just give you one hypothetical here. Okay. I, I don't know that this is exactly how to play, but it could. So we win. We get rid not only of Donald Trump, but we get rid of Betsy DeVos. Can we have a big cheer around that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'd yeah. say something worse, but <laughs> yes, <okay. laughs> cheer. But we're not in the Senate, so we uh, <laughs> can That's say right. ruder things. <laughs> so Betsy DeVos is gone. We have a new Secretary of Education. It turns out that in the very laws that are already there, the Secretary of Education has the power not only to permit the lending of money for all these student loans, but also to cancel the student loan debt. I see you kind of flickered when I said that. Whoa. That's, I mean, it's incredible. Yeah, that's right. I'm not talking about Congress. I'm not talking about whether we have to get a supermajority or just a majority. I'm just saying the power is already there. So we have the right Secretary of Education, and that Secretary of Education comes in and says, I'm wiping out $50,000 of student loan debt, everybody who has an income under $150,000. You know what that would do? I want you to think about this for a minute. It would mean three out of four people who are carrying student loan today will be completely wiped out, mm. just gone. For another group of people, a big chunk of it would be gone. More people would be able to move out of their folks' home. More people would be able to buy homes, to buy cars, to be able to start small businesses. Things that we can see right now that student loans are pre preventing people from being able to do. And the black-white wealth gap, let's talk about that for just a sec. You know, we have this huge black-white wealth gap in America uh, with uh, Latinx kind of right in between. Uh, the two. So also a Latinx white wealth gap. If we design this right, and that's why I said $50,000 and up to a certain income level, we can close that black white wealth gap by about 23 points. I mean, that's a story. We haven't done anything like that in forever. And let me just give you an idea of what that means person by person. Um, when people borrow money when they're in college, we now have studies showing where they are 20 years out. And here's, here's a key one. 20 years out, the average borrower who's white has about 6% of their original loan amount left to pay. The end is in sight. They're almost there. God, 20 years. But they're almost there. The average black borrower still owes about 95% of the original amount borrowed. Wow. Mm. They have to borrow more to go to school, borrow more while they're in school and have a harder time paying when they get out of school. So all I'm saying is, here's something that would affect about 43 million Americans and make their lives tangibly better like that. Here's something that would help us directly affect racial injustice in this nation and do it like that.
Mm -hmm. Here's a change we can make that not only would help the people who are directly affected, but would help boost our economy. You know, money that's going into student loan debt payments is just coming back into the government. This is now money that can go into the economy and help strengthen the economy. Mm -hmm. We do something like that in the first few weeks. I think there'd be a jolt of energy around this nation like we haven't seen in a long, long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I agree with you. Oh, yeah. I mean, a lot of my like neural circuits are firing as you're talking about that. I'm thinking about COVID recovery and how that would help young people who really got screwed by the timing of the pandemic and the mishandling of it. I'm thinking about people trying to start families who sometimes put that put it off because they can't afford it. I think that that sounds like a great idea. I'm for it. Um, Speaking of uh, education, some of the most effective legislators that are exciting to voters right now are women who have been teachers like you um, and like Katie Porter, for example. Um, Do you think more teachers should run for office? And if so, what advice would you give them? Oh, yes. (laughs) Yes, 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 yes. More teachers should definitely run for office. And so here's my advice. Just do it. Just get out there, throw your feet out, and jump in because we need your voice. Teachers have been in public service from the very beginning. That's Teachers are people who invest in the future. Teachers are people who invest in everyone else. Teachers are people who have to bring everyone together, including you know, the kid in the back row who's chewing gum and looking out the window and the two kids over here who are passing notes and the poor kid in the corner who's weeping. And teachers are here to try to help build a world that works, not just for themselves or people who are just like them, but to try to build a world for everyone. And that means we need their voices. And here's the amazing thing. Here's what I discovered. You know, I never thought I'd go into politics, electoral politics, for goodness sakes. I was going to be a teacher all my life. I spent all of my time, once I started getting engaged on policy, on giving it to the real people who are going to make a difference, right? To senators and to folks in Congress and even to presidents. Here's here's the information. But here's what I discovered when... I made the decision to jump into the Senate race in Massachusetts back in 2012. The part that totally knocked my socks off were how many people said, if you'll get out there on point, I'll help you. I know how to do this part. I can set up your your website. I can show you how to um, uh, do a stump speech. I'll come help you do that. I can make phone calls on your behalf. I know how to help pull a crowd together. And even people who said, I don't know how to do anything, but I'm gonna show up and people who are already part of the team will show me how to do it. Mm-hmm. And from that, we built grassroots. And I I loved that about running for office. And, and so here's my advice, do it, get out there, give it a try, put, your, put yourself out there. We have to be in these fights. And if you do, people will come and they will help you. And that's how we'll make change. Hmm. Okay, so here's the light and fun part. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, so Erin and I love to joke that we are political news witches because we are. The, <laughs> we can predict anything that's going to happen because oh, we're news it. witches, sure. Good. So our listeners will kill us if we don't ask, what is Bailey going to be for Halloween and has he voted? So... <clears throat> We already know what Bailey's going to be for Halloween. He's going to be, I wanted him to be a a mail carrier, a letter. (laughs) No, no, hold on. So uh, that was my first choice. I talked with him about it. He was talking (laughs) to it. He said it would be really cool. He wanted the hat and every, it was really, he was ready for the whole thing. Uh, And you know, they have post worker uh, uh, outfits online. So I go online to try to find him the mail carrier outfit. He's too big. They don't, oh. carry, him. They don't carry him in big boy size. Uh, so, <laughs> so Bailey got shut out of his first choice. So he's now on his second choice. 
he's going to be a lion. Oh, adorable. And he looks fabulous. He looks fabulous. He tries his costume on every night for me. <laughs> and, and he has not yet voted. I, I'm down in Washington now, but we're going to vote next week. We already have a plan to vote. So we will do early voting in person, which, by the way, for anybody who's listening who hasn't already voted, if you can do it, there are a few states where you can't, but most states you can do early vote in person. And the in person means you don't have to get into this business about it was an absentee ballot and do they have to check your signatures and does it take a delay and so on. If you can do early early vote in person, bank that vote and then get out and volunteer to get more people in to vote. It's a great way to do it. So Bailey wearing a costume and being proud of it is is something that is unprecedented for a big dog for me. Like we have a <laughs> we have a fifty five pound dog and whenever we put on his Steelers jersey to watch games, he just gets sad and oh. maybe it's just <laughs> <laughs> No, Bailey. Maybe it's because it's a lion. Uh-huh. You know, he does a little bit of that. He looks around the kitchen as if he's looking at his domain. Uh, <laughs> so we're looking forward to it. I, uh, I, I hope we get some kids. If nothing else, uh, Bailey and Bruce and I will sit on the porch and, uh, and watch the kids and oh. put the candy out for them to be able to get it. That's great. And on the voting note, right after we get done recording this, my husband and I are going to drop off our ballots at uh, one of the boxes here in California. So we have a plan, too. We have a plan, too. Senator Elizabeth Warren, thank you so much for being here. This was a lot of fun. And I'm I'm ready to go out and, like, change democracy now. So, yeah, (laughs) I'm very inspired. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. And um, can't wait to see what comes next. Me, too. Thank you.